and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, Dr. John Barke from Ecolab will be our speaker. Dr. Barke is an expert on pest elimination techniques for food and beverage processing, food service, hospitality, and related industries. Since joining Ecolab in 1990, Dr. Barke has specialized in developing thorough and effective integrated pest management programs with minimal use of pesticides. As a senior scientist and program leader, Dr. Barke helped to develop the Ecolab Pest Elimination Division's uh, pesticide evaluation and development projects. He has published many articles on integrated pest management of cockroaches and other pests, and is the co-holder of several industry-related patents. He contributed the Cockroaches chapter to the ninth edition of Malice Handbook of Pest Control. Dr. Barke received both his master's degree and doctorate in urban entomology from Purdue University. His dissertations examine the behavior of German cockroaches relative to attractants, repellents, and insecticidal baits. He is a member of the National Pest Management Association, Entomological Society of America, American Mosquito Control Association, Gamma Sigma Delta, the Honorary Society of Agriculture, Society for Vector Ecology, and the Phi Chi Omega, a professional fraternity for Ecolab Pest, for, I'm sorry, Urban Pest Control, Association of Structural Pest Control Regulatory Officials, Green Building Standards Committee, and Independent Organic Inspectors Association. And with that introduction, I'd like to uh, pass the presentation on to Dr. John Barke. Thank you for your attendance today. Thank you, Miriam, and welcome, everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about small flies. And as has been said, there will be a question and answer period at the end. So please take note of any questions you may have as we go through the presentation. And I'd be happy to answer them for them for you at the end. So today uh, we're going to cover a variety of uh, issues around small flies, and uh, these are pests that have uh, late become more prevalent in food service operations. Uh, there's multiple reasons for that, and we'll go through it. Uh, we didn't have these uh, intense problems with small flies, say, more than t uh, 10 years ago, and there's reasons that these things have been happening. So we'll gain an understanding of that, and what we'd like everyone to walk away with is an understanding of the biology and behavior. Now, why are these small flies present within the facilities? Uh, so these are going to be the indoor breeding, breeding flies, such as fruit flies. Uh, what are the food safety considerations, knowing uh, that these flies are generally breeding in very unsanitary environments? And what are those conducive conditions that are producing uh, small flies within restaurants and other food establishments? And then what can we do? How can we partner uh, in terms of partnering with a pest management provider and what the facility staff should be doing to try and minimize the uh, presence of small flies within food service facilities. So we're talking about uh, four major uh, types of species of small flies. We'll get into the, uh, the specifics of each. Uh, but they are capable of breeding indoors as well as outdoors, especially in warmer climates. They can come in from the outside, and they may be year-round pests, especially in warmer uh, climates. They are associated with unsanitary conditions. So somewhere in the facility, something is fermenting, and we need to identify where those areas are. Uh, there may be excessive moisture conditions that are contributing to these as well. So these need to be addressed, and we'll talk about how to do that. They are capable of spreading pathogens, uh, just like uh, large flies are, such as the house fly. So we'll get into a little bit of that. It uh, doesn't mean that just because your facility has a fruit fly issue that you have a food safety issue in terms of pathogens like listeria, but there is potential for them to move things around, and we'll, we'll talk about that and why it's important that they be eliminated. And they do have a huge breeding potential. Like uh, large flies, uh, they reproduce very quickly uh, within the facility, so we'll go through, again, the biology and habits so everybody understands uh, what that is. So let's start with the fruit fly. Now, the fruit fly is the most common uh, that we're talking about here in restaurants, and we're talking about a different species. One, one reason that we're seeing more fruit flies today than we did, say, 10, 15 years ago is that we've had some new species introduced, and they may be mutations. Uh, this is the dark-eyed fruit fly. It is not the red-eyed fruit fly that many of us are very familiar with and has been around for a long time. Uh, that would be Drosophila melanogaster, 
and it typically stays around the recycling areas more. Uh, it likes the sweet juices and doesn't survive as well in stagnant conditions like the dark-eyed fruit fly can. So the dark-eyed fruit fly can breed in drains. The red-eyed fruit fly cannot. So we've got new species that have come in. The dark-eyed fruit fly is larger and has better mobility within the facility, so they're not just a problem in the kitchens, the back areas, or the recycling. They are getting into dining areas and are, are a nuisance as well as a, a threat to food safety. So they're small, but they're a little larger than the red-eyed fruit fly, so about an eighth of an inch. Uh, they tend to, to brownish yellow in color. Uh, they are visible, of course, to the naked eye, so we can see it, and that's people shooing them away from their drinks and such like that. Uh, uh, it, it can be quite annoying. And customers are becoming more aware of these flies, not just in terms of their nuisance status, but it is a sign that somewhere something is uh, unsanitary within the facility. They can also breed like the red-eyed fruit fly and decaying vegetables, uh, banner and such, so that's where their names basically come from, such as if we're ripening bananas for making uh, uh, banana bread, uh, that would be a target for these flies as well. And they generally enter facilities through produce or from exterior areas and huge breeding potential. Each female lays about 500 eggs in her lifetime. So um, make sure that, uh, that we're talking about uh, uh, this particular fly. And then uh, we will touch a little bit on forward flies. Forward flies are the true drain fly. And uh, these are 164 to a 1 quarter inch uh, in size, so a little smaller, uh, but it depends on the species of forward fly that's within the facility. They've got a humpbacked appearance and they tend to breed in extremely stagnant uh, sewer-like conditions. So it can be an indication of a broken sewer line or very dirty drains. Uh, so it, it breeds in filthier environments than the dark-eyed fruit fly can. And then um, we've got uh, uh, basically areas, mop heads, places like that where we can also uh, see that, uh, that this is a, a, a problem within a facility, but not quite the problem that we see with the dark-eyed fruit fly. Another problem with forward flies is if there's a, uh, a flood or something that happens within the kitchen and you get stagnant uh, conditions or you have seepage of water coming in through wall voids because of excess, excessive moisture outside, these flies can also be a problem. And like the uh, dark-eyed fruit fly, huge uh, breeding potential and uh, uh, they, can, they can reproduce very, very quickly. So the moth fly, not as big of a problem as the other two I just talked about. Uh, it tends to stay very close to its breeding source, but as you can see, it looks like a little moth. And uh, there's, there's many species of these as well, so not all of them look like this, but they all have a characteristic moth-like appearance, and they don't travel very far from their breeding site, so not as much of a nuisance uh, as the other flies are. But they can be a sign of, of poor sanitation somewhere and uh, maybe the drains need to be cleaned. Uh, they can be a problem with sumps, if you have sumps. So they can get, uh, get into these problems. But they fly very short distances, so not as big of a problem, and not as uh, high a reproductive potential as those other two species that we talked about, but something to be aware of. And then last but not least, we've got fungus gnats as another type of fly that breeds indoors. I would be least concerned about these. These are not health pests. They're not, they're not associated with poor sanitation they are associated with potted plants. So if you have live plants inside your facility and uh, even landscapes or plantscapes, if you will, that are being overwatered, um, uh, these flies can be, uh, can be a problem. And the simple solution to these is not to overwater the plants or not have live plants within the facility. Not a big risk at all, but it could be considered a nuisance by some of your guests. So uh, these flies go through a life cycle, and this is what we need to break in order to eliminate the flies from the facility. It's called complete metamorphosis, which means that the adult flies look completely different from the other stages of the, uh, of the fly. So they start out as an egg. Uh, the egg hatches into uh, a, a larva, also called a maggot, and they go through a series of molts. Uh, they grow, and the, the larvae require the presence of biofilm. So somewhere there's bacteria that are producing biofilm which is a source of nutrition as well as protection for the larva. So anywhere you can think of that uh, biofilm may be forming is a potential area for these flies to be uh, reproducing. Then they go to a dormant stage called the pupa, and then that sits for a while while the uh, larvae, uh, the, the stage eventually changes with inside to the adult fly, and the adult fly emerges, uh, which you can see on, on the left there. So that's, that's essentially the life cycle, and it takes about 8 to 10 days, so they're very very fast uh, uh, move around here, 
and they live. The dark-eyed fruit fly lives considerably longer than the uh, the red-eyed fruit fly we talked about. It can leave, uh, live up to four weeks, whereas the red-eyed fruit fly is typically gone within one to two weeks. So it's a long, uh, persistent lifespan for a fly, and that adds to it uh, being a significant problem within food safe uh, food service facilities. So. Uh, let's talk about their seasonal pressure. They can occur year-round in warmer climates. What is key is the floor temperature. Uh, oftentimes these flies are breeding at the floor level where we've got drains, we've got stagnant water, drain zones as we call them, the area around drains where they can also be unsanitary uh, and uh, they can be also in drain lines, uh, breeding in sugar snakes. Sugar snakes are just a form of biofilm that are being produced by bacteria. But uh, in uh, warmer areas they can occur year-round but if the floor temperature is getting below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, then that's why we see in the wintertime typically uh, fruit fly populations going down. And now it's fruit fly opener. We've got the springtime coming here in the, uh, uh, in the, in the northern part of the world, and uh, it is uh, time for the fruit flies to start emerging and becoming a problem over the summer and early fall months. So we can look forward to that. Now, fruit flies, uh, we talked about them uh, being a nuisance, but they they're are a, a, a risk to your brand. Uh, we know we've got social media out there and word spreads about pests, and you've probably seen some of this in the past with certain chains that get into trouble with either cockroaches or flies, mice, rats, where somebody can just tweet, uh, put something on Facebook or Yelp, and uh, it spreads like wildfire versus the way it used to, but just by word of mouth. So it's very important that you do your best to keep these and other pests uh, out of your facility as it's getting much more awareness today through these social media sites. And then health department regulations are becoming more rigorous. Uh, they are looking at these flies as a sign of poor sanitation. It'll vary from municipality to municipality, state to state, as in terms of how important uh, health officials or even the individual inspector will grade these uh, within a facility. But they are noted and oftentimes are noted as a minor violation in terms of sanitation. And then uh, something that we need to keep out of the out of the media as well. So uh, make sure that we're taking care of it from that standpoint. But really, the important thing for all of us to consider in food service is the uh, food safety considerations of these flies. Uh, their indoor breeding sites are, uh, as you can guess, very unsanitary areas. Trash receptacles, uh, feces in case of forward flies. Uh, dirty drains, stagnant standing water, stagnant mop heads, all of these can produce bacteria, and you, you know the odor. If you smelled it, you can probably smell your way to the fruit flies, especially in bar areas. There's that yeasty smell and such like that that the flies are very attracted to for uh, egg laying. So anywhere you can smell these, it, it's potential that that's a breeding site. So pest management pro providers will often use their nose when doing uh, inspections to identify unsanitary conditions that are contributing to these flies. They rest away from the breeding sites. They're most active at their breeding sites in the early morning hours before anybody necessarily is even in there. Then during the day, they go out, and this is when they become a nuisance. They like to rest up on walls, and this can be uh, deceiving because that's not the area of the breeding. The area they're breeding is the, the, the lower areas, the drains, and all these conditions that we're talking about, which can be far away from their resting sites. So, again, these are much more mobile than the uh, smaller red-eyed fruit fly ever, ever was. They have sponging mouth parts, and they need to uh, absorb liquid food. So they'll first regurgitate liquid from the stomach to dissolve the food, the same thing that a house fly does, which makes them particularly uh, uh, unsanitary and nasty and spreading things around. And they use these uh, mouth parts to feed on the dissolved food, and they leave characteristic spots. They'll leave fecal or vomit spots uh, uh, where they're walking so and landing. So these are something, again, that the pest management provider and yourself should look for, uh, and then a potential to spread disease as well. They are uh, potential mechanical transmitters, so they're, they're picking up these organisms on their tarsi or their feet and uh, also their mouth parts, and everywhere they land, they season that surface with whatever it was they were landing on before quite capable of picking these materials up. So this is that mouth part. It's called a proboscis, and you can see it feeding on the liquid food here, and it can be a source of uh, contamination. And when they land, they'll defecate as well as make the fly speck from their, their sponging mouth parts. This is a ceiling tile that shows small fly, fly speck. They like to get up on ceilings and walls, and you can see that they're, they're coming together along these cracks and crevices in the ceiling tiles. 
and this is an indication of a, a fruit fly population that was probably very bad at one time or still exists. This is E. coli on the mouth part of a house fly. So we know that flies are uh, capable of picking them up through their mouths. Um, and uh, certainly, I think that the small flies, although it hasn't been documented at this point, uh, are capable of doing the same thing if they're breeding and feeding in these unsanitary areas. And this is E. coli 0157 on the, on the mouth part of a house fly in a, a rural area. And of course, there they're feeding on manure uh, and breeding in manure in the farms. So they're, of course, going to be picking up these bacteria. Uh, this ugly thing here is uh, the foot or the tarsus of the fruit fly, the dark-eyed fruit fly. Uh, what's the curved organs there are the claws, the tarsal claws that they grab onto rough surfaces. And uh, then, the, uh, then the organ that we see here that's down to the bottom here, this is called the pulvillus. It is a sticky organ and is used to stick to uh, uh, smooth surfaces. So these flies can land on any surface and they're perfectly happy being upside down or whatever. Uh, the material shown on here is actually a uh, biofilm that they have picked up from their breeding areas. And these were taken uh, from, from uh, fruit flies that we raised in our laboratory uh, here at Ecolab. So you can see they've got a great potential for picking things up and carrying them around. This is another angle. And you can see that when the small fly is landing, the first thing to hit the surface is the pulvillus, or that sticky organ, followed by the tarsal claw. And that helps them grab on very tightly. And moving in even closer to the tenet CT, there you can see right there, they are little suction cups. So that's what allows them to stick so well to walls and hang on, uh, and then also transfer material around within the facility, such as uh, we see a glob of something here. So what I want to show you now, and I, I know some of you may have a little trouble with streaming uh, with a video, but uh, uh, go ahead and um, and uh, just just have some patience as we as we load the video here, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go ahead and play. What I want to show you here is actual fruit fly grooming behavior, and they don't like to get things on their bodies. So that, believe it or not, flies are constantly cleaning themselves. Even though they're unsanitary pests, they do clean themselves. And what we're showing here is the fruit fly grooming behavior after we have uh, uh, exposed that fly to some fluorescent dye, and it's a powder. So we've got a little bit of powder that this fly has picked up that's fluorescent. And what you can see, it's grooming behavior. You'll see in the back, uh, you'll see in the back here uh, of the fly those little white specks that are that it's depositing. It is uh, very effective in removing that dust, and then. Um, and then uh, uh, it is, is very capable of uh, moving all sorts of materials around. So that's the whole point of that, uh, that video and shows very well that they don't like things on their bodies, that uh, anything they get on them, they will, they will remove immediately. Now, from a scientific standpoint, we have been conducting studies here at Ecolab Research and Development, uh, the uh, entomology lab partnering with the microbiology department and uh, actually exposing uh, fruit flies to contaminated uh, uh, areas or contaminated breeding uh, sources, and then positioning uh, auger plates with a specific auger for different organisms, uh, either in a uh, vertical position, which you can see here, we've got a Petri dish here placed on the back wall, or we put it on the floor. And then what we have is a vial with their, uh, their what their breeding material is. So that has been contaminated with a, uh, a bacteria of some kind. And then what we can see is down here are the results with a control with no contaminated uh, 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 breeding material. We don't see any bacterial growth, whereas uh, in the horizontal treatment, uh, the one that's on the floor here, this is the result of that. And each one of these little spots here on the, on the Petri plate is a little footprint. And now we have a colony of bacteria growing on that auger. So you can see very, very well that they're capable of doing that. What's very interesting is the vertical placement. We see many, many, many more, more bacteria colonies here, and that is because they do prefer to rest on walls than they do the floor. So they're going to be more on the walls and the ceilings than they will be on the floor when they're resting. So this matches their, their behavior, and I, I personally think that's, that's quite interesting and shows that well, there's potential for them to take a pathogen from the drain and deposit it uh, onto walls and other surfaces. We also have gone out to restaurants and surveyed uh, their breeding sources for what type of microorganisms are producing the biofilms and conducive uh, to, the, uh, to the small flies. And uh, what we've, uh, what we've uh, done is uh, what you can see here. This is a floor 
that the customer had poured over the old floor. And it, it was a strange material, some sort of rubber-like matrix uh, that was designed to you know, improve the floor condition at the time. Well, now it's breaking down after many years. And you can see here we've got openings. And what's happened is the fluids during the day's operations, uh, water, whatever's there for cleaning, food debris and such, are seeping under the, uh, uh, the layers of the floors and are producing thousands and thousands of fruit flies. Uh, down here is a section of floor that has been removed, and we can see all of the pupa and such right here. It's hard to see from there, but this is the pupa of the flies here, as well as the biofilm uh, forming uh, bacteria. So uh, we have one of our microbiologists here, Dr. Elaine Black. She is sampling these areas and then identifying, uh, isolating and identifying what are the different microflora that are present in these areas where the fruit flies are breeding. And uh, this is an a example of the types of organisms that we found in these restaurants. Uh, some can be uh, definitely at risk to people that have uh, immunodeficient uh, problems. So these would be more of a problem in hospitals, uh, getting into breathing tubes and such. These are the same microorganisms, the same biofilm-forming bacteria that could be a problem in hospitals and patients and even in our mouths and such. Uh, these, are, these are bacteria that are uh, quite, quite filthy, but not necessarily a risk uh, to food safety. Good news is we didn't find any salmonella or E. coli or listeria in these studies, but we did find a variety of well-known biofilm formers in these areas, as well as other organisms uh, that, uh, you know, Bacillus subtilis here has potential to uh, be a, a, a food, uh, uh, foodborne pathogen, but really the others are all uh, considered to be uh, generally non-pathogenic, except in immunodeficient people. And then other organisms, yeasts, common in soils, common in water, these are things that we, we would accept, expect find uh, in these environments. So as we talked about, they like to rest up on walls, and I'm sorry uh, for some, whatever reason that uh, that other slide has not come up properly, but what it shows, was supposed to show you, was the flies actually the larvae in a biofilm. And it showed very clearly that uh, these larvae are, are writhing within these biofilms as a source of protection and a source of nutrition. So up on the wall here is not where they're breeding. They are breeding somewhere far away from here and it's going to be in those types of environments that we talked about. And uh, take a look at this. Uh, this. This is a picture that was uh, uh, taken some time ago of a kitchen, and you can kind of imagine that this, this is a, an older facility that's come qu quite a bit in disrepair. We have corroding uh, beer trap uh, uh, drain, drain panels here, and the drains are actually here. So we've got the liquids and such seeping under there, uh, under the bar beer tap area, and of course beer, once it starts uh, fermenting and becomes stagnant, is hugely attractive to uh, fruit flies, and uh, the females will lay their eggs in these areas. So we've got multiple opportunities for layers here. Broken tile, we've got the grout that's out of condition, and water's going to seep in there and get under and produce, uh, an, again, another area where the small flies are breeding. So uh, this is definitely an area that's in need of a facelift, and uh, you know, structural repair will go a long way to uh, making sure that we're not producing voids, gaps, layers of material where fluids can seep into and produce perfect breeding gals that we can't access to clean easily. You may not be able to access these areas where these fruit flies are getting. So keeping cracks and crevices sealed, uh, floor tiles in good condition, all of these are very important to keep the pests from, uh, from being a problem. So uh, let's move on to another picture here. What, what's happened in this is a rather high-end restaurant where the chefs, uh, who aren't in charge of cleaning are kicking materials in under the cook line during their operations and hope that somebody else comes by and cleans it out for them. Uh, this is one of the few times I've had to actually wear a respirator. Uh, we're cleaning uh, these materials out for a customer because the odor was so horrendous. And it's one of the few situations where I've actually seen blow flies breeding because the chefs were, cooking, were kicking uh, meat products under there, which were uh, not being cleaned out in a timely manner, and the blowflies are, uh, yeah, they, they feed on carrion or rotting meat, and they're actually breeding indoors, and that's a very unusual and hugely unsanitary operation. So make sure you're able to clean under your equipment. It's not just for the small flies, but cockroaches, rats, mice, all of the critters got all the food they ever need here to survive, so this is a huge, huge problem in this and other facilities where we've seen cook lines that aren't mobile, they can't pull them out, so you can't clean properly behind them. Put all of your equipment on wheels. Make sure all of it can be gotten under for proper cleaning because clearly uh, this can be a problem and conducive to pests and uh, very unsanitary situations. 
And, of course, we've got our, uh, our fruits, our vegetables that they're highly attracted to and make sure they're, they're covered. And if they're covered, uh, as they're, you, you don't want to cover them with a completely uh, uh, solid lid. Make sure they're screen mesh that's small enough to keep the flies from getting in and out um, that, because they will lay their eggs. Um, uh, like it or not, we've all eaten our fair share of fruit fly eggs over our lifetime. They're not going to hurt you from that stage, uh, but it's because these flies, they, they, they lay very small eggs. And they get uh, they get into these materials very quickly, especially once they start uh, uh, ripening. And then, of course, garbage storage. This is a uh, garbage area where we had a lot of the dark-eyed fruit fly breeding. And what we have here is garbage that's not being removed in a timely manner. And it's overflowing, and it shouldn't be overflowing. You want your garbage containers cleaned and sealed and closed. And, of course, we don't want bag rippage or anything like that where the garbage is spilling and, uh, and, and poor maintenance. And then just showing here the, the bottom of a gar trash container that's not been cleaned. We've got maraschino cherries, all sorts of other things that are conducive to the, to the flies. So keep your trash containers clean, spick and span, both inside and under, because if underneath there's, they're touching the floor, they can produce uh, stagnant conditions there. Ripening bananas. We all like our banana bread, but make sure that's covered, not exposed like this, because I guarantee you there are thousands of fruit fly eggs in these bananas uh, as they sit there. And then, of course, dirty drains with the biofilms and such that are forming there. Uh, that's going to be an area where the flies breed. And they like to breed around that lip. So inside uh, the professional kitchen floor drains, there is a, almost always a lip where uh, food debris can accumulate underneath. It's very inaccessible. Uh, you have to open up the drain cover and scrub it out. And uh, uh, just so you know, pouring bleach down the drain does not kill small flies. So uh, just pouring it down there. We'll talk about other solutions. But... Uh, bleach will not work. Uh, the biofilms will protect the, the maggots and they will recess into it. Shown here is a sugar snake that was blown from a drain line. Now a sugar snake is just another word for biofilm and it's been produced by bacteria and you can see we have a lot of biofilm here so we've got the fruit flies breeding in these lines, leaking uh, soda lines, soda dispenser lines that are leaking the, the soda itself. Of course beer taps, places like that all can produce these uh, types of biofilm forming. And then where we're storing our mops. Are we keeping our mop heads clean? <clears throat> and is it, is it a well-drained area? All of these are hot spots for the, uh, for the small fly. This is a beer tap uh, drain. And right here we see the, uh, the little fruit fly rearing its ugly head down in the drain and somewhere down in that drain in biofilm that are, that are producing these. And uh, it's important to, to blow out these lines or clear these uh, drain lines out and you'd be surprised what comes out at the other end. Uh, here shown here is actually leaking uh, beverage dispenser lines, and this is a mass of fungus. This blue uh, colored material here is fungus, and then above it are masses of fly pupae. So this is all, uh, I don't have a close-up to show you, but it's just big clumps of the small fly pupa. Uh, so this is a sign where they've been getting all the nutrition they need. They go into the dormant stage, and then the adults emerge from here. Garbage disposals, big time problems when they start leaking. You have cracks and crevices here that the flies can access, and when these leak, they are leaking just the right juices for the flies to come in and feed on. Keep this equipment in good repair. Beverage dispensers, look at the standing water here, the standing pop, if you will, and then it can get very filthy in the back, so it's not access for, access for cleaning. Open these up once in a while, keep them well cleaned. Uh, don't allow water to stand. And not pictured here are espresso machines. So if you have espresso machines, uh, fruit flies love rotting coffee grounds. They like to get into espresso machines. There's something about coffee that they like when it starts fermenting. If your coffee grounds are spilling as you, dis as you discard them into the uh, discard area and they're accumulating uh, in cracks and crevices around there and it's wet, they will breed in those coffee grounds. So keep those, keep those well cleaned and managed as well. Also floors. Watch where that floor tile is coming up, and water may be seeping behind the wall, especially if the baseboards are not in good repair. So you don't want water getting behind the wall because there you have a completely inaccessible area. It's very conducive to those forward flies I was discussing before, and everybody wonders, well, where are the forward flies breeding? They can be very hard to find because they're breeding in areas where the water is seeping into that we can't access. There's a close-up of some fly pupa on a beverage line so you get a better idea of what we're looking for. And each one of these little dots here is a pupa and uh, can uh, uh, produce a, an adult a small fly. 
Uh, floor tile. Watch out for these floor tiles because, again, we get the water seeping in under there. This, this, is, a, this is a very bad condition. Here we've got a mat that's over a massive area of, of broken floor tile. They will breed beneath these mats that are very common in kitchens, so make sure you're cleaning those on a regular basis. Uh, if they're not cleaned and water gets under them, they, it's a perfect spot for the flies to breed. Down here we can see where the baseboard's been removed. There's all sorts of mold and such behind there because the water is seeping back there. And then, of course, faulty equipment where you have leaky dishwashers and uh, other dispensers that are spilling water, other materials onto the ground. Keep your equipment in good repair and keep the site as best you can structurally in good repair so that these opportunities do not arise for the small flies to breed in. Just another example, standing water, and we've got maggots here actually uh, writhing in this situation. You can't see it. I would like to show you a video. It's quite appetizing over lunch. <laughs> but, uh, no, this is a very bad situation when it was found in a uh, restaurant in the French Quarter, which never shut down. They never shut down in the French Quarter, and uh, that can be a problem, too, if you're not shutting down for cleaning or deep cleaning. Uh, what's going to happen is you're going you're gonna to wind up getting, uh, getting these issues. So make sure your restaurants are taking the time to shut down clean properly on a regular basis. Now these are forward flies being caught on a, a glue board uh, and uh, they're coming out of this vent uh, by the bajillions. What has happened in this situation is there is a broken sewer line and it's below slab. So when you get a broken sewer line below slab, everybody can guess what's happening. It's dumping sewage under the facility. And then the forward flies come in and like it or not, most restaurant managers do not like to hear that they have a broken sewer line because it is thousands and thousands of dollars oftentimes to repair, but it needs to be repaired. So what you need to do is call in a pr professional plumber. They will have scopes that they can put down the drains and identify exactly where the break is, and then that area needs to be excavated and uh, the, the uh, repairs made and then <coughs> efforts to take to clean up clean up the sewer sewage that has been spilled underneath. So if you have these flies emerging from vents from, uh, from expansion joints uh, in the floor, that means there's probably something wrong with either moisture under the slab or, at worst case scenario, a broken sewer line. So what can we do? Well, obviously, we've talked a lot about the filthy conditions, so that's something we need to fix. So we need to be uh, sanitizing, so clean drains weekly at least and use a good uh, detergent. You don't need to clean all the way down into the P-trap. These flies are going to be breeding up towards the surface of the drain. So under the rim, the drain grate itself, uh, and uh, you're looking again for that gelatinous biofilm material, and uh, which are sources of the larva. And then we talked about the broken pipe under the slab. You're going to need to get somebody out there to fix it. And uh, uh, we know we don't like to do things like that because of the cost, but that's, there's really no, no other solution in a case like that. And then clean and sanitize floors every day. Uh, quat sanitizers used at 800 parts per million are toxic to the small fly eggs. So it's, you can't use it for that purpose, but you should be cleaning and sanitizing. So quat sanitizers themselves will be helpful in not killing not just the biofilm forming bacteria, but also the eggs of the fruit fly. And that's studies that we've conducted here at Ecolab. So think about uh, uh, making sure you follow up with that cleaning step with using a quat sanitizer of around 800 parts per million. Mix it carefully. Uh, those are caustic materials, and they can be dangerous to the eyes, so make sure you're wearing proper PPE when you're using quats. And uh, eye protection is very important, and uh, follow the label. Follow the label exactly on how the product should be used uh, because quats, especially in concentrate form, are, are dangerous to the skin and the eyes. And then scrub the floors using a stiff brush. Avoid power washing. I, 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 I can't stress enough, power washing can cause more trouble than, than using just a regular good floor brush and uh, a good mop because they can damage the uh, they can actually damage the, the surfaces through their power cleaning. They can rip up the floor tile, they can rip up the grout, and they can splash food debris and such to places that make it even worse to clean. So please don't do that and don't dispose of organic material down into the drain. Uh, that's again we've shown some pretty graphic pictures that show that that's going to be a problem. And then work with your pest management provider. Uh, they'll help you identify where those structural uh, deficiencies are and where we need to pay attention to better cleaning. So you need to partner with a licensed, professional, and experienced pest management provider because these are one of the most difficult pests to identify where they're breeding and eliminate. They're not easy. Uh, everything I'm saying here is, 
you know, it's, it's easier said than done when it comes to cleaning because some of these areas are extremely difficult to access for cleaning, and the fruit flies will take advantage of that. And uh, so work with your pest management provider. They're going around with a flashlight. You should do the same in uh, difficult-to-see areas, and uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, make sure there's a spot for everything within your facility so that people aren't, uh, you know, in terms of equipment, uh, CO2 tanks, whatever it is that's within the facility, has its proper location so that you know uh, what to inspect and, and, and what to do to reduce the potential for that area to be conducive to these pests. Now, light traps, I just want to bring these up because these are effective in terms of reducing the population of large flies within, that get into your facility, but large flies are not going to be breeding inside your facility unless something horrible is going on, uh, as we talked about that one example. But the small flies are breeding in your facility, so the use of these lights will only help monitor whether or not you have a fly problem, small fly problem. They will not effectively reduce the population of small flies in your facility. So these are used only for monitoring purposes and for also reducing the population of large flies uh, that may be coming in from the outside. So these need to be strategically placed, inspected on a regular basis by your pest management provider, serviced, maintained, et cetera, so that they can be an effective tool in helping with the inspection process. There's different types of units available. There's wall sconce. Uh, uh, the uh, one pictured on the right here is more for food processing plants. Uh, it zaps the bugs through electricity. You don't want these present in your kitchen because they will spread the fly parts uh, as they zap, and that's a food safety issue. So use the fly sconce units. Uh, they're good monitoring tools and will be effective in reducing uh, uh, house flies and other flying insects that are coming in from the outside of your facility. And then uh, what the pest management provider can do, again, make sure you're getting together with somebody that really knows what they're doing, a licensed professional capable of uh, understanding the, the, the whole life cycle and where these flies are going to be breeding. And so they're going to conduct a thorough inspection. They're going to locate those breeding sources. And then there's different types of treatments that they can do to reduce these flies breeding within your facility. So uh, discuss these as well as preventative measures you and your staff can take to even keep small flies from even being a problem in the first place. Okay. Uh, minimize exterior breeding sites. Close all garbage receptacles. Again, make sure they're well sealed. Eliminate any standing water around the, the, the facility. There's other types of uh, pests that take advantage of water around a, a facility. And then minimize the entry points. In very tropical areas, uh, warm, humid areas of the U.S. and other parts of the world, these flies will be breeding outdoors and can come inside and be a problem inside as well. And then inspect incoming goods. Reject those that show sign of spoilage. There's likely to be some small fly eggs in there. And then uh, minimize the interior breeding sources, everything we've been talking about. Eliminate that standing water. Have those standard cleaning practices to remove biofilm and organic matter on a regular basis. Repair all those structural deficiencies and store perishable uh, uh, items in closed plastic tubs like we talked about. And then chemical elimination will be necessary uh, to, quickly, uh, to quickly eliminate these populations, just knock down the adults and then, and then kill the, uh, the larvae and the pupa. So we need to break that life cycle, and there's different types of treatments your pest management provider can do to target all of the different life stages of the small fly. This is the way we want to see them, all right, dead? dead, dead. If we do everything that we're supposed to do together, uh, we will uh, eliminate these flies and uh, they'll be belly up. So um, it's, it's important that it's a partnership. It's not just going to be your pest management provider. There's things that uh, you'll have to do with your staff and the facility. Otherwise, uh, we won't be successful. And uh, I just want to put, put, it, put it out there in North America and both the United States and Canada, uh, Ecolab uh, just launched a targeted small fly service, which does just everything we were talking about, about breaking that life cycle. Uh, we've got specific equipment, new chemistry, and new application uh, technology to be able to eliminate uh, small flies from your facility. Uh, it involves multiple steps that we do. We've got chemistry that's very specific that can even be applied to areas that can't be cleaned properly, which is a, a big problem in some restaurants, being able to access certain drains that are under equipment and can't be gotten to. We see those bundles of drain lines coming into the drains that uh, don't allow us to be able to clean that drain properly. So we've got some solutions that we can do for those very difficult to reach and treat areas that we didn't have before. So just wanted to put a plug in for that. Currently just available in the U.S. and Canada, but we will be making this available in other parts of the world <coughs> where Ecolab pest elimination is present as we move forward. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. It's not available everywhere, but we are working on making that available to you. 
So with that, I would be happy to take questions. Well, John, thank you so much for a very informative uh, presentation. I think the mix of science as well as some good practical advice is very, very helpful. Um, I got a couple of questions first regarding fruit flies. Um, I've heard that fruit flies are spreading disease in citrus trees. Um, can you comment on that, please? Oh, yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there's a, there, there are different species of fruit flies. Uh, the fruit flies that's spreading disease in citrus, uh, citrus trees is the Mediterranean fruit fly. So that is an outdoor species that is not going to be breeding uh, in, your, uh, in your restaurants. It's a quarantined pest that if it gets into the United States, it's known to spread uh, uh, citrus diseases, um, and it happens at the flower level. So don't worry about the Mediterranean fruit fly causing any uh, diseases or such within your facility. That's strictly an outdoor and agricultural pest. It's not related to what we're talking about here. Uh, thank you. There was another one uh, related to fruit flies as well. Uh, it seems that fruit flies are more prevalent now than they were two, 10 years ago. We never had this much of a problem solving it. Yes, yeah, they are much more of a problem uh, today. And a uh, couple big reasons for that. One is we talked about this being a new species. This is Drosophila repleta. And also another one, Drosophila virilis. There's probably others. And these are larger fruit flies than the Drosophila melanogaster that we've all dealt with in the years past. They just, just haven't been as big of a problem. And many years ago, you know, not many, but uh, 10, 15 years ago, we had pesticides available to us then that are not available to us now. And many of these were organophosphate-type insecticides, uh, which is a different chemical class. And when we would go in and target for cockroaches and other pests, we would get collateral damage against the fruit flies from these because as the uh, molecules of these pesticides became airborne, they were toxic to the small flies. And so it's a combination of us not having the same chemistry that we had years ago uh, that, that basically all you had to do was show the fly the label and it would die. This stuff was <laughs> much, much more toxic materials than we're allowed to use today. And we got some benefit when we were going after, say, cockroaches that wherever we were targeting cockroaches, there were no fruit fly problems. So couple of could just a couple of industry things uh, the EPA is becoming much more restrictive on what pest management providers can use I think there's good and bad to that the good thing is uh, we need to be conscious of our environment and our health so we need to target certain types of insecticides that could be a risk to that uh, but unfortunately there's sometimes uh, a lack of science between be, behind some of EPA's decisions uh, and they're being overly cautious but that's EPA's job is to be overly cautious until they can be convinced that uh, otherwise that you know th there's not going to be a problem so i think that's good the epa is watching out for our health uh, but sometimes they don't have the proper science behind what some of the decisions they're making and the pest management industry needs to step up in that case and make the case thank you i had a couple different questions regarding drain cleaners um okay. you, you indicated first off that you're just pouring chlorine bleach down the uh, down the drain does not uh, effectively get rid of fruit flies. Um, what about enzyme treatment or other appropriate cleaners to clean the drains? What should people be using? Sure. The best approach is to do some physical cleaning first, and uh, you know get in there with that brush and use just a, a standard detergent to help do that. There's no magic behind what type of detergent you use because you're simply cleaning, and you want to clean that top of the drain uh, as best you can. But uh, yeah, there are enzymatic cleaners that can be put down on a daily, daily basis that help to uh, dissolve organic materials. They do take some time to do that. They, uh, there are effective products on the market that can do that. Uh, but if the drain has a very heavy load of either organic material or, and or water, uh, that is not likely to work as well simply because those enzyme cleaners will be removed readily during that process or just can't keep up with the load. So it depends on the drain. It really does depend on the drain. So I wouldn't be too concerned about what type of detergent you use, um, but it is a good idea to follow it up with a quad sanitizer, as I talked about, and that helps to kill any remaining bacteria that may produce biofilm, and as we talked about, it can be toxic to the eggs. Thank you. Um, someone has asked, I think this is perhaps the, the same question, but let me just send this out. How effective are treating drains infested with fruit flies with an enzyme digestion product 
We have seen success at our plant with this. Does Ecolab offer a product like this? So was that what you were just speaking about? Yeah, we've we've got we've got products such as this, and uh, there's there's uh, something we could we have called uh, uh, drain gel uh, that can be applied. We've also got our, uh, our wash and walk product uh, that can be used. Uh, well, we've now got a sanitizing wash and walk product that we just launched here at Ecolab, and those can all be used in drains and such. And they're they're enzymatic. They're uh, there's uh, you know, there, there's just a matter of again what is the load of that drain because these can be very effective products and uh, it depends on the situation so if you're keeping up with the load and putting these in on a daily or regular basis yes you will see good results and you'll see uh, your some of your issues with small flies go away but if you can't keep up with that organic load uh, then they might not be as effective in that situation thank you uh, one question is, how, and perhaps you'll understand this, how many pesticide applicators do you know that are proficient in small fly management? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would be Ecolab, of course. But, uh, um, you know, I honestly can't answer, answer that question for my competitors. Um, you'd have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. There is education in the industry about these flies. Uh, pretty much the industry recognizes this as a sanitation pest. So some companies may not even have, offer a service. Their, their simple solution may be just to tell you to clean. And that's all we did for a long period of time until we eventually gave up knowing that at best we got 50% results in getting restaurant operations to clean properly or clean effectively because there's situations where they're challenged in not being able to do so. So uh, maybe they've got a service approach. Maybe they've got, got some products they could sell you to put down the drains. But it's really, as I said, one of the most difficult pests to eliminate if you don't know what you're doing. So make sure you're partnering with a licensed professional that has an approach to, to small flies where they say, yes, we can get rid of these and uh, we, can, uh, we can offer a, a period of time uh, when you won't see these uh, flies after we've, we've performed the service. Okay. And here's um, someone asking regarding comparing the, the black spots you mentioned that are left by flies uh, along with the little black um, salt-like particles that cockroaches leave behind. How does oh, one tell the difference between the different black specks that they see? Very good question here. Somebody's on their toes. Yeah, the, the specks from the small flies and house flies will be on the walls. They'll be uh, they'll be basically look like a, a splattered uh, liquid of some kind. So they're, they're, it's actually something that. Uh, it uh, is quite different from the cockroach droppings. Cockroach droppings, the German cockroach droppings look like uh, pepper, and uh, they can be easily removed uh, just with a sponge or something like that. They're, they don't adhere to the surface, whereas the fly speck is, is adhering to the surface and needs to be wiped off. Um, and then there's larger cockroach species, such as the American cockroach droppings, are as large as a house mouse. So the, the American cockroach droppings look like house mouse droppings, so mouse droppings. The difference is the cockroach droppings under a microscope will have ridges on them, so your pest management provider will be able to tell the difference between an American cockroach dropping and a house mouse dropping because it's important that we be able to distinguish between those two. Thank you. So we also have a question about the pore spouts in a bar. Um, how do we prevent the attraction to the pore spouts besides just taking them off and soaking them uh, is there another suggestion? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, probably if you're a bartender or you work behind the bar, you've noticed in some of your liquor bottles at the bottom uh, some small flies that have gotten into your containers. Um, the best thing to do is to wrap those in, uh, if you've got a small fly issue and hasn't been eliminated, uh, is to put a little plastic over those to keep them from getting in uh, because they can get into that as well as the holsters. You know, the, you've got the beverage holsters. Make sure you keep those clean because maybe sometimes you've seen when you take that uh, beverage hol the, the beverage gun out of the holster, all of a sudden you see some small flies emerge from that holster. Well, that's because they're breeding inside that holster. Shine a flashlight down in there. You'll be able to see the pupa. Scrape all those out. Get those cleaned out because that's a very common breeding source. So, yeah, they will be attracted to alcohol. Alcohol is a very, very potent attractant for these flies. That's why they're sometimes called the, the real bar fly, uh, because they're hanging out where they smell the yeast from the beer, and the alcohol itself is also an attractant. So they will attempt to get into those liquor bottles, and um, you know, then they, they, uh, uh, you'll see a layer of them or something in the, in the bottom indicating that uh, 
uh, you've got a problem. So keep those wrapped if you have a um, situation with small flies until you can get those eliminated. And do that on a nightly basis. Thank you. Um, in terms of you know, return on investment, we have a question here from someone who is an infection control nurse. And she is asking, how do you get the, whether it's a hospital or food service, how do you get them to make these repairs um, when cost is always such an issue? How do you get them to repair the floors, do a better job cleaning drains and all of these things? What's a good ROI comment that you can give to our listeners? It is about education, and, uh, you know, I understand the cost involved with everything I've talked about here. You can't, uh, you can't, you can't stress enough that I know what I'm saying here is, is not easy. It's not an easy ask. Uh, but you think about the cost to this hospital if these small flies happen to find their way into the operating room. Now, maybe this is a long-term term care facility. It's just a nursing home. You don't have an OR. But where these small flies have gotten into such situations, it can shut that unit down, and that can cost millions of dollars a day. You do not want small flies getting into or around an operating room area. The surgeons will not produce, will not uh, perform surgery because there's risk of these flies getting into the uh, into the open uh, uh, surgical areas. So um, make sure you, you, you look at it that way, that the, what's the cost of these flies causing some sort of health issue within your facility? Uh, that, that's the way I would look at it and uh, say this is, this is important from an infection control standpoint. We've demonstrated that they can pick up pathogens and move them around. You saw that in this presentation. We will be publishing this information. We haven't got it published yet other than to speak about it uh, during these webinars, but this is going to go in writing someday uh, as we're working on it right now, and uh, we're going to be getting this information. I don't want to be over-alarmist in saying that just because you have small flies, you've got risk, risk of listeria, you've got risk of salmonella or, or whatever, but they, everything we've shown you here is that they're breeding and feeding in very unsanitary conditions. You've got patients with de immune deficiency. Uh, I'm sure many of them do because they're elderly. And if they get into a breathing tube or they get into uh, an open wound, uh, it, they, they, they have potential to cause real issues. So I'd look at it just as just, I think it's perfect here that your inf infection control, look at it from that standpoint, educate them. Uh, this, uh, we're going to talk about how to access this. Uh, this has been recorded, so you can look at this again and uh, show your staff, you know, the importance of small flies and keeping them out of the facility, keeping your facility in good repair. Thank Great you. Question. We just have time for a couple more questions. One is, is there a problem with gnats breeding on the underside of tables and stainless steel countertops? Only if they're sitting there for a while. So if they're not being removed and cleaned on a regular basis, uh, only if uh, you're uh, you're not picking those up and cleaning them because the life cycle takes a matter of about a week. So I wouldn't imagine you want to leave those sitting there for more than a few days before cleaning. So try to do that on a regular basis. What's more of a problem is when we have older facilities, when they do reconstruction or repair of tables and such, instead of replacing the table with a new uh, unit, they might put some a layer of new, say, stainless steel over an old wooden table. Well, of course, there you've produced a gap, and we see this oftentimes. And then the, through the cleaning activities of the staff when they're wiping, uh, there's going to be cracks and crevices there that maybe aren't properly caulked, and then the fluid goes in under between those layers, and now we've got an area we can't access for cleaning. So I would not so just say, you know, from the standpoint of renovation, make sure you're doing it in such a way that it's not producing layers. We get the same problem with cockroaches in, in uh, FRP wallboard where there's layers of these materials makes it very difficult to eliminate these pests in these situations. Excellent question. Thank you. And I think just for um, parting comments, John, as people leave this webinar today, what are three key takeaways they can go and implement today? Uh, number one, uh, keep up that cleaning and that structural repair that we talked about. That is your responsibility. You need to own it, and that's what you need to own and uh, take immediate action if there is a, uh, a small fly uh, problem within your facility. Number two, partner with a professional pest management provider that has experience in, uh, in going after small flies, being able to identify the issues, work with you on the, uh, what those recommendations are going to be, and ultimately provide a service that uh, removes uh, the actual flies from the facility. So those, those are probably my, my two biggest takeaways. And number three is stay educated. 
and uh, you know where people aren't uh, doing the proper cleaning. Watch after your staff. Make sure everyone on your team understands the importance. I know everybody's tired at the end of the day, and who wants to do all of this cleaning and prep work or whatever it is that needs to be done. But good practices in place. It should be routine. It shouldn't be something that there's just a sudden panic when we need to do these things. If you keep these on an ongoing basis, uh, keep your place organized, no clutter, uh, clean up any spillage, well-sealed uh, garbage containers, uh, regular, regular removal of the garbage and such, and keeping those drains clean, good repair, you know, all of the things that we've talked about, it's an education and uh, persistence because this is an insect that, again, is one of the most difficult to eliminate if we're not keeping up with it. Well, thank you so much. Um, John, if you can go to the next slide, please. Sure. And the next one. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you very much for all of you joining us today. And this is a reminder, this presentation will be available uh, at the end of this week. And uh, all of our previous webinars are also available at youtube.com uh, slash food safety net. And next slide. So just a reminder that we have these webinars every month on the third Tuesday. Uh, next month, we will be doing a recap of the Conference for Food Protection, which is uh, a group that is, that is comprised, uh, comprised with those from industry, academia, um, regulatory, and consumer groups that feeds information into the FDA regarding food safety re uh, recommendations. Um, we'll be hearing from Dr. Donna Guerin, who's the Vice President of Regulatory and Technical Affairs with the American Frozen Food Institute as well as Susan Quam from the, the Wisconsin Restaurant Association, and we'll be hearing about what's coming up in food safety. So we look forward to uh, talking with you next month, and please uh, stay on and finish up the survey that will pop up automatically after the webinar ends, and that's where you can request your continuing education certificates. Thank you very much. <laughs>